really heating up in our PCR talk and today I want to tell you about hot start PCR and heated lids and a couple of other random things about like choosing polymerases and that sort of thing when you're doing PCR. So it's a more kind of like technical talk um, so check out yesterday's post if you need to know more of the basics of PCR but basically it's a way that we can make lots and lots of copies of DNA. Hot start polymerases are going to make it so that we reduce like unwanted um, primer artifacts and the heated lid is going to make things so that our concentrations of the reagents and stuff in the tube doesn't, um, stays constant and everything doesn't just like evaporate out. All the water doesn't just like evaporate out and leave everything else clumped behind. Um, and so let's get into the details. So with PCR, what we're trying to do is we are trying to amplify a specific region of a DNA template. So make lots and lots of copies of a specific region. And so yesterday I introduced you to this analogy of how I like to think of DNA polymerase or copier as kind of like being a train um, traveling along these um, DNA tracks um, and it's traveling along the single strand of track and laying down track ahead of it as it goes. But it needs to be told where to start. Um, it needs to, you need to add like the start stations um, and this is done with the use of primers. Um, and these primers are one per strand is going to tell the DNA polymerase where to copy. Um, so the DNA polymerase can only copy five prime to three prime. Um, and so you need one per strand. The first strand, the polymerase will run till go till it runs out of steam. Then in the subsequent, um, then the next cycle, basically it's going to end where the other strand started, um, because that's where the temp its template will have um, stopped. Um, and then all the future cycles are going to be um, amplifying the pieces that were bookended by the primer start sites. And so this is how you get the amplification of a specific region. But yesterday we also talked about how there could be some problems. And sometimes these um, problems can come from the primers. And so we're trying to make really, really specific products. But if those primers are binding non-specifically to other regions, then we're going to have problems. Um, and we can also have problems um, that will get like non-specific products. So we can try to make sure, depending on how how specific, how depending on like how exact we need to be amplifying, like how exact our start and stop sites are, we can try to choose like a different site. We can use software to try to help us. Um, but sometimes you can run into this problem where the primers are actually binding to themselves. Um, so either like folding back and binding on themselves in hairpins or they're binding to copies of themselves. Um, they're binding to copies of the other primer. Um, and the, when it's forming these like sort of primer dimers, so when it's forming like um, binding to a copy of itself or binding to the other primer, what can happen is that you can get um, these like amplified artifacts. Um, and this can be a real problem. So not only are you getting all these artifacts, but you're also kind of like reducing the amount of the actual stuff you're getting because you're using up all these primers to form this these side products. So this tends to um, be a bigger problem, like when you're setting things up and like in the beginning stages of the PCR when like the machine is heating up and stuff. Because remember, we need to actually like melt apart these DNA strands. So we need to raise the temperature a lot in order to melt these strands apart. So in, in the meantime, these primers, so the primers can't access this DNA, but if they can access each other, what they can do is they can form these dimers with one another while you're like trying to set up your reaction. Um, and then you can kind of get these amplified artifacts um, before the primers even have a chance to try to find like the actual DNA sequence if they're forming these um, like dimers to one another. This um, can be a particular problem because you have such a high concentration of your primers like compared to your template as well because um, you have to basically have a lot of the primers because one, you'll need them each cycle. And two, when you melt these, you want to keep make sure these strands don't like stick back to themselves. So basically, every time you melt them apart, you want to make sure there's a bunch of primer just waiting to sneak right in.
And but if you have a bunch of primers, then you have a higher chance of having these primer downer problems. Um, and so this can be a big problem in some cases. And so one of the ways to um, avoid this problem is using hot start PCR. And so basically the idea is that you want to hide a critical PCR component until you're ready to go and then you'll release it by heating. So if we think about our PCR reaction, we can hide the DNA polymerase. We can hide the, um, the DNA letters, so we can hide the DNTPs. We can hide the magnesium. We can hide the primers. Um, these are some of the main things that can be like hidden. Um, and we need a way to hide them until we have some sort of like activation cue. And we can use heat as an activation cue. Um, and so there are different methods that do things differently. Um, so there are a lot of different like commercial methods um, that'll hide things in various ways um, in various components. So one of the main ways is with like antibodies binding to DNA polymerase. So antibodies, we think about them a lot in terms of like the things that our body makes to fight off disease. But basically they're just these little proteins um, and through chance, um, they, our body's experimenting with making different antibodies and then by, they're swapping these like variable regions. Um, and these, um, uh, some of them are going to bind to a thing that they come into contact with. If this is a foreign thing, then your body's gonna start making a lot of copies of them. But the key thing is that we can get, and we can make, get like lab animals to make antibodies. We can get, um, and that sort of thing. And so you can make, get antibodies made against like all sorts of different things, not just like virus proteins. Um, and once you have the sequence of a good antibody, then you can like make them in cells and stuff without even needing animals. Um, and so you can basically, the basic point is that you can get antibodies against the DNA polymerase that you're using and that these antibodies are little proteins. Why this matters, the DNA polymerase we're using is like has high thermostability. So basically we take these polymerases from thermophiles. So things like bacteria and archaea that live in these really, really hot environments. Um, and so they naturally have heat resistant proteins that we can use. And so we're using this heat resistant protein, which is really important because in the PCR, we're going to be going up and down and up and down in the temperature in order to melt the strands apart. Um, and so that the primers can bind and the polymerase can copy. Um, and so we need the protein to be stable for that. And so when we use these proteins on these like TAC proteins, they're stable enough for that. But when we're talking about our antibodies, we don't need them to be able to withstand these super high um, temperature, like in our bodies, we don't need to them to be able to withstand super high temperatures. Um, so when we use like antibodies and stuff, these can get denatured by the heat and then that's going to make them fall off of the polymerase. So when you heat them up, they're going to fall off and this is going to free up your DNA polymerase to then go amplify the sequence. Um, there are other strategies that block DNA polymerase in other ways. So a similar strategy blocks them with aptamers, which are like short oligonucleotides. So this can be like DNA or RNA or like modified forms of them. Um, and basically you can get, you can, there's a bunch of different tools that you can like try a bunch and like select for ones that will specifically bind something. Um, and so, cause they can like fold up into various structures and things. So you can think of them kind of like antibodies, except they're like, I mean like lab made. Um, but in terms of that, they, you choose them, you select them some way so that they specifically bind to something. And the way that these are specifically binding is because of the, they can like fold up into shapes and stuff and um, the very sequence. The basic point is that they're going to bind tightly to something specifically. And so these are going to tightly bind to DNA polymerase. And, but when you heat it up, just like we're gonna melt these strands apart when we heat them up, we're going to um, melt our DNA, our aptamer off, um, and it's not going to stay stuck when you heat this up and this is going to free DNA polymerase. You can also kind of, instead of like blocking it, you can kind of hide it. Um, and so you can hide it. Um, by sequestering it in like a wax bead. Um, so 
you know, wax when it heats, it's going to like melt. Um, it's going to free up, let the polymerase free. Um, and so you can hide the components in these wax beads and then we heat it up, they'll go free. Um, so those are blocking the polymerase. You can also block um, the other thing. So you can block the DNTPs or the primers. Um, so this is often done by like modifying the free three prime OH. So this o three prime OH is what's going to be used by the polymerase to add to add the next DNTP on. If you block that, then you can't add on. If you block it with the thermolabile protecting group, so this is like this bond is going to be sensitive to heat. If you block it with something like that, then what's going to happen is when you heat this up, it's going to come off. Um, and so then once it comes off, then you have a free three prime OH that can be used to, um, to elongate the chain. Another way is to like hide the magnesium, um, such as by making it precipitate. So DNA polymerase is going to need the magnesium to function. And so if we can use like a high concentration of like the magnesium and of phosphate, um, like counter ions, we can basically form this insoluble precipitate that will dissolve once heated. So with any of these, you're preventing this from happening before your reaction actually starts. Yeah, so with um, like conventionally whatever, you have to add the, you set everything up and then you add the polymerase very, very last. Um, and that can help some of the problems, um, but it's still not complete. Um, and so you have less to worry about when you have like a hot start polymerase um, that you're basically, it's like you're not adding the polymerase until you want it. Um, but you don't have to like physically worry about like adding it right before you add it and then hoping the machine heats up quickly. So another thing that can happen when you heat things up is that water can evaporate. Um, so it can come out of um, its nice liquid form. Um, and then if it, if you have, and this can then, and this can basically then condense everything that's left behind. And so you're changing the concentrations of what's in the tube. Um, and so you set up your reaction with everything in these nice concentrations that you've measured out and you have headed everything so nicely. And now all the water is leaving and so everything's getting more concentrated and then things aren't working out right. Um, and so you can get problems with like consistency and efficiency um, if you don't use so and a way to get around this is by using um, a, this like a heated lid. So the basic idea is that when you have um, the dif the dis difference between like a liquid and a gas is just the amount of energy that the molecules have. So water molecules are really sticky to one another um, because of their polarity. So they have the oxygens really electronegative. And so it's gonna be hogging the electrons are sharing, making it partly negative, And then the hydrogen's partly positive. You have negative and positive, And so they like to hang out together. So they tend to stick to one another, but they really want to be free. They want to be like a gas where they're free from one another, but they need enough energy to break free from those attractions that they feel to one another. So if they are uh, like in a liquid, basically they're just sliding past one another. So if they break free, there's another liquid molecule there. Um, but if you give them enough energy, then they can evaporate. So they can come out of, um, come out of the liquid form into this gas form. Um, and then you get this, like when you have something cl a closed system, you're gonna have some sort of equilibrium where you have um, some amount of evaporating and some about condensing. Um, and this is going to depend on the energy, um, which is going to depend on the heat. What happens is that when you heat this up, when you heat up your tubes, the water is going to start evaporating everything else is going to be stuck down because everything else is going to be non-volatile. So it's not as easy to evaporate. Um, and so all of this is going to get condensed down in the bottom. When you have a cold lid, it's going to condense up here because when you basically, when it hits the lid trying to escape, um, you have this like flow of um, energy from like higher energy to lower energy from hotter things to colder things. So basically the heat from the water is kind of going to transfer to the lid um, because the water is hotter than the lid is. 
in the case where you have just like an unheated lid. So your water molecules are going to condense on the lid because they're going to lose the energy that they needed to stay as a gas. When they lose the energy they need to stay as a gas, you're going to have more liquid. And so basically we're getting this, remember we need that, we're gonna have that ratio of liquid to gas molecules. But now basically our liquid is going to be partitioned between um, down here on the bottom where everything else is and where we, we, want, we have the components that we need for our reaction to happen. And then up here, we're going to have just water, which can't do anything by itself. And now our concentrations are all screwed up down here. But what's going to happen if the lid is heated? So with the PCR machines, they can like they often give you the choice to like heat the lid. Um, what this is going to do is now when the water hits this, there's higher energy here. And so the water is just going to get an energy boost. Remember, we're going to have the heat flow from the hot to the cold. So the heat is going to actually go into the water, give it more energy. And so it's going to stay a gas. And instead, it's going to, when it condenses, it's going to condense down here in this liquid where everything else is. And so this is going to allow your concentrations to stay at where you calculated them to be. And so everything else, everything is here in this reaction where you want the stuff to happen. In the older days, they used to actually like put like oil um, so that the water wouldn't um, evaporate on the lid. Uh, but then you have to like go through oil and stuff to get your stuff out. So um, the heated lids are a lot nicer to work with. So those are a couple of the choices that you can make um, when doing PCR to try to make things go um, better. In addition to like hot start polymerases, there are other modified polymerases. Um, with different um, like degrees of efficiency. Um, so like how fast it goes, processivity, how far can it go without falling off? So often these use like clamps, which can be separate proteins or fused proteins to the polymerase to help. Um, fidelity, does it have like proofreading ability or is it making a lot of mistakes? So you might not care about fidelity that much if you're just trying to like see is there a band or not? Is that gene there or not? Um, and But if you're trying to like amplify the sequence to for cloning or something like that um, or sequencing, you really need a high fidelity polymerase for that, but you might lose some of the efficiency. Um, and then, of course, we need thermal stability. Um, and so often what's happened is you take a DNA polymerase from an extreme um, thermophile, um, like, like our intact polymerase, and then you can like make modifications. So um, like the ones that we use, wherever it's like fused to uh, like a clamping protein to help with the processivity. Um, and so there are different variations on that. And then, of course, you can optimize the various temperatures. Um, that you're using in the different PCR steps. Um, and so hope that helps you understand some of the little um, things going on in PCR. So yeah, so today was just kind of like one of those like bonus behind episode type of things when you have, I guess when you're listening to like a podcast or whatever, and then they have like extra stuff that didn't fit into the main. Um, so this is just kind of a little like other things that probably most people don't really care about, but it's sometimes like you just wonder when you're actually doing this stuff a lot, like what the heck am I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, and that sort of thing. And I always like answers. So hope that helps.